welcome to our uh, one of our uh, main panels today, our Privacy Leaders Panel. Uh, we're going to cover a wide variety of subjects with a terrific panel for you today. So um, I'm going to start by uh, having our just quick introductions of our panel as we get started. Um, folks, feel free to make your virtual appearance on the stage. Uh, and we'll introduce you to our, our, uh, our panel today. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Alex Gibbons from the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, Alex, great to have you here today. And um, you mind uh, giving just a few minutes about yourself and, and uh, CDT, a, a, an organization that's known to, to all of us here in the community. Sure, thrilled to be with you today. Thanks for this great conversation. I'm looking forward to the dialogue. To those of you who aren't familiar with us, CDT is a nonprofit based in DC with an office in Brussels as well that focuses on protecting civil rights and civil liberties in the digital age. We do a lot of work on consumer privacy, both in terms of advocacy around what legislative and enforcement priorities should look like, and also direct to company advocacy as they think about their internal practices. We think about the responsible use of data, the governance of AI, government use of data, and a host of other issues as well. Uh, thrilled to have the conversation today. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Great to have you here today. And I'm just going to go down the line as you guys are showing up on my screen here. So um, Jocelyn Aqua of PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, a longtime friend of Wirewheel and Spokes. Um, Jocelyn, great to have you here today. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about your, your area of focus? At PwC? Sure. Sure. So I am the privacy and ethics leader at PwC. I have been working for, for um, five years since I left the federal government, helping companies build out their privacy programs, their data governance programs. Over the last year, I've assumed a similar role within my own company. We are moving towards being a, a products and technology company in addition to providing services. And as we're doing that, in order to build trust, we are building out more of a first line um, privacy program with accountability and privacy by design with our engineers and our first line. And um, it's been a really fun transition. So and Jocelyn, uh, you had a similar role in the national security agencies before, is that right? I did. So I worked for many years at the federal government working both with the Department of Justice and the intelligence community thinking about um, privacy and oversight and compliance of our um, biggest assets are data in the government. Awesome. Well, great. A lot looking forward to the discussion here today. By the way, Alex, before I move on from Jocelyn, uh, CDT, in addition to serving as one of the leading think tanks in the area of uh, digital issues and, and technology and privacy, also is the longtime sponsor of the Tech Prom, which used to be part and parcel of what everybody looked around, but looked forward to when you came to DC uh, in the summer. So the tech prom is back this year. Is that right, Alex? It is. Love you getting in a good party plug early in this conversation. <laughs> yes, tech prom is back this year. We are framing it as the reunion because we are so excited for people to get back together in person again. It's going to be happening on Wednesday, October 20th here in DC at the Anthem. And all are welcome. Information is on our website at cdt.org. Terrific. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to that. It's my um, favorite event of the year, <laughs> truly. We're looking forward to seeing everybody again there, Alex. Um, all right. Uh, Nishant, can you, uh, from Uber, leads privacy engineering. Nishant, can you tell us a little bit about your, your area of focus? Sure. And thank you for having me here, Justin. My name is Nishant Bajaria. I head the privacy engineering and assurance organization at Uber. So I sit in the engineering security organization. I report straight to the chief information security officer. And I've had similar roles before at Netflix, Nike, and Google. And I've been at Uber for a couple of years now. My job entails building out the tooling, the processes, the technology to make sure that what legal wants, what compliance want, what third-party partners want, what our customers expect by way of trust is secured via tooling and instrumentation within the company. How do you optimize that at scale? How do you make sure that you stay one step ahead of the regulatory apparatus, ensure that you're using compliance as a floor, not a ceiling? That's kind of my remit. And I do this in the middle of a fast changing atmosphere when it comes to privacy law. So that's kind of my job. You should think of me as both the residence engineer, as well as the connecting tissue between the business and the legal arm of the company vis-a-vis -vis privacy and security. 
Terrific, Nishant. Well, that, that'll be a great, maybe good starting point for us here in a minute uh, in our discussion. Uh, that's almost always uh, an area of focus for folks in our community as well. Um, uh, and Dan Soloff, uh, we have, Dan and I host a regular series on privacy conversations, uh, and he's the CEO of Teach Privacy as well as uh, a very active publishing schedule these days, Dan. So welcome to the conversation. What, what do you have? Do you have any books coming out these days, Dan, or, or articles we should be paying attention to? Uh, well, uh, last year I came out with a children's book on privacy called The Eye Monker. Um, I have a book coming out uh, early in 2022 uh, called Breached. Uh, it's with Professor Woodrow Hartzog, uh, and it's on data security law. And it's designed to be a, a, a book that's not too wonky, um, so it, it should be accessible to a broader audience, uh, explaining uh, how the law uh, falls short uh, and uh, needs to have a different view of um, the problem to be more effective. Uh, so that, that's coming out uh, early next year. Um, I, um, I teach at uh, GW Law School uh, and uh, as Justin mentioned, uh, run a company that does privacy and security training. It's computer-based training. Well, uh, terrific. Well, look, uh, we this group has written on a lot of subjects between either you and your organizations that I'm sure are going to be uh, of of focus for our community here today. So let me let, let me kick off the discussion uh, with a first topic. And before I do, I just want to ask um, you know folks who are attending today, if you have questions for any of our panelists, just post them to the Q and A and we'll get them, uh, we'll have a discussion point in a, in a few minutes here where we can start actually uh, uh, addressing some of those one by one. Um, so first, I, I thought we'd start today first with Nishant. Um, obviously, as uh, all of us are prior, uh, privacy leaders, uh, and each of you in your organizations and in the community, you know, whether you're leading a think tank or writing about this, are looking at the challenges of bringing technology to the table to help solve some of the problems. Um, as much as cloud computing and the incredible availability of storage and processing, uh, the proliferation of sharing of data through widely available integration platforms as a service, you can license and subscribe to quantum computing uh, power on some of the cloud computing platforms now. So it becomes more and more available. It creates privacy issues that we have to address. And yet there are some ways that we can start addressing some of our challenges on the privacy side by bringing together our leaders across an organization and bringing some the right privacy enhancing technologies. Um, Nishant, it's hard to do. Uh, you often have the responsibilities for doing this, bringing that together and picking the right stack and implementing it. You have it compartmentalized across an organization. Um, the community that leads on privacy right now often hasn't been given a ton of training on the technology stack <laughs> and, and how it works and how it ties together. Uh, the budgets are sometimes diffuse. They, some comes from privacy, but it might come from IT, and you have to build that case. So, Nishant, you've done it now in a, a number of big organizations, so I thought I'd start with you. And you've also written a book on the subject uh, to, to sort of give some, some uh, guidance to the community. So, Nishant, how, how have you done it? How have you really started to bring these, these communities together inside an organization to to bring the right technology stack and implementation team to get this right. Uh, thank you for the lead up, Justin. So before I became a privacy engineer, I used to be a product manager and I used to be the person that said, collect as much data as you can. My job was to collect what I could, store it in as many places as I possibly could so I could use it for as long as I could. That was me, the old me. And the new me sometimes hates the old me because I got to clean up my old me's messes. So that's kind of my credibility that I bring to the table. And my book is appropriately titled Privacy Engineering. And what has happened over the last five years, and I'm even going back, back before GDPR, 
is that you have all these requirements to clean up your data for consent decrees, for enterprise contracts, to get into new markets. And as an attorney, whether you're Alex or Dan or Jocelyn, you're asking yourself, what are my engineers not telling me? What do they not know? The engineers are like, I got to ship all these products. I need to make these deadlines. And now I have this new privacy thing dropping on my head all of a sudden at the last minute. Within this atmosphere, to add to the fact that there are all these diffuse budget requirements, you have an executive layer that doesn't quite know what's always going on. How do you build a privacy program that has A, the right tooling, B, the right connections, C, the right verifications, and D, it scales with time? That's what this book is about. So I help you build tools for deletion, for data subject access requests, for privacy reviews, for extraction of data, for obfuscation. So all the tooling you need to do, I'll get you started off on the right step in the book. It's also a book for the advocacy community so that they understand what actually happens inside companies, how trade-offs are made, how decisions are made, the difficulties with cleaning up old debt. Because remember, you don't start from scratch. You literally start somewhere in the third or fourth base range where you literally have to do stuff that contradicts what you have been told to for like four or five years. The third audience is the executive layer, the people who cut the checks, the people who pay my salary, the people who have to make difficult trade-offs in terms of, do I ship this or do I get this last change made, right? So it's a book aimed at three different audiences, but the first audience is the Nishant of 10 years ago when I was getting my first privacy program stood up and I literally didn't know where to start. And nobody wanted to say anything because saying something meant that you were essentially disclosing your lack of progress in that domain. So this book is aimed at helping the attorneys, the engineers and the executives in no particular order. No, that, Nishant, that's great. Uh, I mean, very helpful as a framing. So let's give us an insight that you really brought to the table. But uh, how, how, talking to the community, what's, what are one or two things that you would recommend a privacy leader, say non-technical, yeah. can do to really work with the engineering teams to bridge the gap? Like, how do you think of that? And what are a couple of techniques you feel like the, the community can learn from? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there are two techniques I like to have in my back pocket. So first up, this false myth that engineers don't need to understand privacy law and attorneys don't need to understand engineering needs to be put to bed as soon as possible. It never should have woken up, but it needs to be put to bed forever. I expect attorneys to take an interest. I don't need attorneys to write code necessarily, but understand how does data flow through a system? How do two or three different teams work together? What happens when somebody opens Netflix.com or opens up the Uber app. What exactly is happening with the data and the systems, right? At least have an intuitive understanding. I routinely make sure that my teams present to attorneys and attorneys come and present to us. We have a lunch and learn series where we host not just leaders within the company, but leaders within the industry as well. I want teams to develop this muscle of working with each other. This business of getting into silos has hurt the industry significantly. And so we build stuff for people like us and then we isolate the rest. The tech lash in the larger macro space happens because we have become a little too comfortable in our own communities, whether it's attorneys or engineers. So I would make sure that people bring people together. That's number one. The second thing I would mention is from a privacy perspective, just like you would with security, build tools that are centralized and scaled. So as an example, let's assume you have 2,500 or maybe 5,000 microservices within the company. Each of them needs to furnish disclosures to users. Each of them needs to collect consent. They all need to be susceptible to DSAR requests, right? Are you going to have each of them build their own separate consent tool or DSAR tool? How do you verify correctness? How do you do this at scale? How do you, how does an attorney even check to make sure it's all done correctly? To say nothing about different geographies, different product lines, different countries, et cetera. If my team can build that stuff centrally and engineers across the company can adopt them, that leaves more time for those engineers to build stuff that makes the company money. And it makes sure that my stuff, my team is the only one accountable for doing it right. So let's say if Alex is the chief privacy counsel, she has my throat to choke, not literally, hopefully. And she can just come and check in with me to make sure that I'm doing it right. And if I do it right, every other team within the company that onboards my tool does it right. And we can do it at scale. So again, the same argument goes for a tool like Wirewheel. You guys do it right at scale, so everybody else doesn't have to build it right. And there's a combination where sometimes it's my team doing part of the work, it's your team doing some of the work. But making sure that there is the connecting tissue on the one side and making sure that there's some level of central ownership on the other side usually works well. And I would strongly recommend to teams across the board that I understand it's hard in the beginning, but get started, have those conversations. You are not as far behind as you think you are. And hopefully this book will help you get started out so you can essentially make those incremental steps. It's a bit like working out. The first mile is hard. By the fifth mile, you're literally burning through the calories pretty quickly. That's a, that's a great way to start. And maybe I could, and, and great insights. 
I hope you do serve espresso at some of these meetings between the engineers and I've been, I've been to them too, Nishant. But let me let me pivot for a moment over to Jocelyn uh, first, maybe, and then Alex and Dan. You, Jocelyn, you moved from like you worked inside the government and you helped bridge often between the intelligence, you know, sort of user, business user, and the tech teams. Now, then you started doing it for large companies. Now you're doing it for your own organization. How did those? How does Nishant's um, sort of first points resonate with you, and and how are you doing it in your world? So, so I would say they thank you, and and they resonate perfectly because this is exactly what happened. I would say the government has it a bit easier than when I came out, and I didn't realize the benefits of having statutory obligations to have requirements, to have a court requirement that you have to explain how you're effectuating surveillance before you do it. It requires lawyers to really understand technology and translate. It also requires to figure out ways to age off data after five years. It has to happen. There's a statutory requirement. There's laws that require minimization. You need to understand how to do it. You need to be able to purge at that individual element level. And when I, and you know, there's also the eGov Act for privacy um, impact assessments. There's a lot of it is already built in as, as basic requirements. And over the last decade, being able to have that ability to translate and that requirement to take to have the engineers and the operators understand privacy law and regulata regulations and then have the lawyers translate that back to a court was vital. And we had such failures you know, decade, the other de decades ago that it has been a growing trend to really train everybody through lunch and learns and, and really making it a, an embedded requirement for all attorneys who do this type of work. I came out tr working with big companies and realized that it was really hard because they just didn't have that structure in place. And I had to pull my resources from what I did in the government and start building it out that way. And with the advent of GDPR and other bigger requirements and these, these, these um, various laws, the landscape changing, having to think through a global framework has been really tough for many companies. I do wanna reflect how hard do many, most companies do try to comply and figure out ways. And as Nishant said, having to change from having 150 years of data in storage and things to that effect and really try to comply with the data subject rights and things to that effect and think about why do you really need so much data and now I'm coming to my own company where we were a services company for so long but really a huge proponent of trust and building trust and now with you know in 2021 we have technology and we're building products and how do you then translate that trust kind of mentality when you're also serving as a different type of a company, you really do need to think about it less from a check and challenge second line and more building it in and embedding it in from a privacy by design kind of framework, which requires engineers having to roll up their sleeves and learn about regulatory landscapes and, and you know, all of the compliance and privacy people understanding how cross script works and also like what happens with your data when it's, you know, in the system. I mean, it really requires like everybody rolling up their sleeves. And, and I would say the one thing that we do bring to the table when we translate is getting to a yes. And that's what I took from the government. You can't just say, no, it doesn't work or no, we can't do it. You have to solution the way to get it right. And as a non-engineer, I really do have to require like everybody to understand the concept. So some young engineer can come with to me and say, guess what? Like I figured out a solution for us to automate this. I don't have that skill set, but I, I have to at least give my, my people the right understanding of why it's important so they can solution in, in, a, in ways that I could never ever be able to think about on my own. And so I, it really does resonate and I, and I feel strongly that we're on the path and everybody's trying to do the right thing. It's just hard, you know, it really is. And without companies, I think, who help with technology where, you know, that, that is the only way to move forward in, in you know, in, in 2021, honestly. Yeah, no, jo uh, Jocelyn. So Jocelyn, I'm gonna pivot. That's a phenomenal pickup from Nishant. So I'm gonna pivot back and forth, Nishant, between uh, some of the items you were talking about and, and now go to the community uh, on some policy issues that are gonna drive some technology items, Nishant. So, if we step back for a moment uh, for all four of you, we have a couple of major trends that are gonna be pushing some technology changes. 
Uh, one of them, uh, and maybe Dan, Alex, I'll start with you two, uh, if you don't mind. There's a proliferation of either of state laws coming now on privacy. It's a, in some ways a great thing to see this movement move across the US, uh, in some ways picking up from where California started, California one and CCPA 0.2.0, now you see Virginia, and now you see multiple other state laws kind of coming uh, to pass. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Dan, and then go to you, Alex, just for a moment. Dan, what's your reaction to the sort of proliferation of these different state laws that seem to be sort of picking up from California? Um, and you know, maybe Alex, if you if you can comment too, how do you two see the trend there before we come back to the technology side? Well, I think it's a really interesting trend. And I think it's also part of, the, there's a worldwide trend to uh, passing privacy laws. If you look at the, uh, the number of privacy laws in the world, uh, there's been a tremendous decade over the last 10 years with so many countries coming online with comprehensive privacy laws. It's really remarkable. Uh, and now in the United States, we're seeing this big effort on the states. There's a new effort to uh, try to get something done federally. Um, I'm, not, I'm still you know, pessimistic about the uh, possibility of, of getting a federal law, even though I think the climate couldn't be better for getting a federal law. Um, it's uh, just a, a very difficult time uh, getting Congress to make the kind of compromises that it would need to make to come up with a law like this. Um, so I ultimately think what we'll see is more activity in the states. Uh, and uh, that story is going to be an interesting story. I, I, it's my hope that, that states would uh, innovate and pass laws that aren't just copycats of California, uh, because while California does some interesting things with its law, it still doubles down on uh, the notice and choice approach and the opt out uh, approach that uh, generally has not been particularly effective in, in, in privacy laws and relies a lot on something I call privacy self management, which is to put a lot of the burden of managing privacy on the individual. Um, but I think that it's really difficult for individuals to effectively manage their privacy across the hundreds, if not thousands of companies that uh, have their personal information. So I'm not sure that that approach uh, is uh, these days um, the, the best approach going forward. Uh, and I think that one, one thing I, I do see that, that that's good is that the laws are starting to regulate certain things that um, previously they had not. Um, dark patterns is an example. A dark pattern is a, is a deceptive privacy design or interface that um, is either deceptive or manipulative. It, it tries to uh, trick people into making choices about their privacy that uh, ultimately are, are thwarting to people's expectations or that people aren't um, really wanting to make if there weren't that deception or manipulation. Uh, and previously, this was a conversation about privacy by design. Uh, and regulating design was considered to be a big no-no because that would uh, step on the shoes of engineers, second guess engineers, and policymakers were always hands off. We really don't want to start regulating technology. Uh, but now with this great new label, dark patterns, uh, it seems to be fair game. And I think we're going to see it in more privacy laws as they are enacted in various states. And so I think that we're entering a new realm where this is going to become uh, a new element in privacy laws uh, as they evolve. So I think that's an interesting development, but I still think that there are still a lot of laws that are very much um, just trying to copy a little too much from California uh, and and not really do you know something that is that that is more more interesting. Uh, so, but overall, I think we're going to see a lot more legislation. Uh, it might take a while; it'll it'll span over years. Um, and uh, I doubt the there'll be a federal law to to really um, you know stop this tide. Uh, so, we're going to see this regulation and. We're going to see regulation until the problem is solved. 
Um, and I'm not sure a lot, you know, California would solve the problem or uh, these laws are going to fully solve the problem. Uh, and ultimately, people are very concerned about their privacy, as they should be. And the, you know, the law has been very slow so far to really adequately address those concerns. And until the law addresses those concerns, there are going to be more and more laws. And, you know, I think, I hope that industry gets out on top of the issue and really tries to address this problem, because until they do, uh, until those concerns are still going to be raw. And as long as they're raw, that's, that's the fodder for more privacy laws. Justin, I'll jump in at your invitation. Um, and, you know, I do agree with a lot of what Dan said. I mean, I think what we're seeing is just an overwhelming surge of interest in this issue. You know, state legislatures act because they are hearing from constituents and seeing this as something that resonates with voters. And that's a really important message for people to understand. I think uh, recent years have just allowed people to understand what privacy harms actually mean, right? That it's not just this abstract thing that you need to care about, but we look at discriminatory uses of data. People have a sense now of how data might be used about them to shape the opportunities that are available to them online, to shape how decisions about them are made. And that really hits home because it elevates the stakes of the conversation uh, and helps people understand why these issues matter. I think we can see some good news from the states. I mean, so we have three laws enacted now, but bills introduced and moving through committees in you know, dozens of other states where these conversations are happening. And my hope is that that sends a message to folks up on Capitol Hill that the energy really is out there and we need to get more serious about the conversation. The last Congress saw a phenomenal uptick in congressional conversations about federal privacy bill. Again, probably a couple dozen bills that were introduced tackling different aspects of the problem. Um, and a lot of convergence from, and movement, frankly, in terms of adding new protections, thinking through what the suite of elements of a federal privacy bill should look like, and thinking through just what are, you know, kind of what are the table stakes? Like what are some of the basic things that we know have to be in there? One of the things that's really mattered to me and to CDT as an organization is just making sure that for once and for all, we're putting behind us the, note, the idea of notice and choice being the governing paradigm here, that we need much stronger protections that just establish a baseline for consumer expectations. And I think we've seen really good movement in that conversation, including even from you know, Republican appointed Commissioner Wilson at the FTC has talked about that being a paradigm that needs to be set aside for some baseline protections. So how do we actually make movement on that and momentum? Um, I think part of the challenge is that right now everyone else is hanging on the sidelines waiting for the ref to like call the start of the game. We really need the Biden administration to step in and be that ref and say like the game is beginning, let's really have these conversations and try to move the ball forward. Um, otherwise it's just too hard for people to come out of their corners and actually begin showing where they're willing to move on these various bills. Um, so we need some signal that there is going to be energy here. Um, I think one of the challenges is that there are so many tech-related issues pen, you know, pending in society today, but also that Congress is trying to navigate. There are really active conversations happening around competition. There are really active conversations happening around Section 230 and intermediary liability protections. And so part of this is also figuring out, well, which of the dials should we be turning to address some of the concerns that people have about how the how major tech companies are using people's data. My hope is that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, that it doesn't have to be just to pick one and turn that really hard and then leave the others. I don't think that's a responsible way to govern and it doesn't really reflect the uh, reality of, of how these technologies are being used and the types of issues that consumers need to be wary of. But I do think that there is energy there and, you know, I think there's one telling example as in the rash of competition action that we've seen just in the past couple of weeks alone. If you had told me a couple of years ago that the House Judiciary Committee would be passing out with bipartisan support, a package of legislative proposals to dramatically reshape competition law, I would have been surprised by that outcome, right? Um, people can take pot shots at those bills. There are things that are gonna to need to change that moves towards the floor and gets considered in the Senate. 
But that shows that people are understanding the importance of these issues. And my hope is that we can start to get privacy protections with that same level of energy and momentum as well. Because it's not enough to just talk about breaking up a couple big companies. We need to be thinking more globally about sector-wide issues around the use of data. And privacy legislation and the steps that have been made in these conversations do go much further at addressing a broader set, a broader set of issues that speak to voters and speak to consumers and I think need to stay on the table. You know, that's a great point, Alex. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna, just to make sure we keep this balance between the technology and policy areas, we have just a phenomenal set of topics come up between the four of you. Let me frame it in two different ways. So I'll, I'll start with Nishant and then come to come to the rest of the panel. Nishant, you've you've heard in some ways from uh, Dan and Alex and Jocelyn that we may be in a situation for a period of time, even if we have momentum, as Alex was saying, behind or should be momentum behind a general, you know, global privacy, uh, a national privacy law where you could end up with five, six, seven, 10, 15, whatever, state laws that are comprehensive state laws on privacy that are kind of the same, but just, just to keep it interesting, a little bit different in each example, right? So for you, Nishant, I'll turn to you to say, how do you think about that as you're trying to get the team to build the right technology and you're gonna have like variations, that, that many variations, at scale. So maybe you could turn to you for that in a moment. And then Definitely. I'm going to put it back to the panel just so you all can start thinking about this. In the context of privacy regulation, not only do you have the, the uh, state law issue moving, there's a very significant set of court decisions. I have some great lawyers here. So court decisions on FTC authority. And I don't think I want to leave today without getting your views on the TransUnion case, which just came out last week. So We'll come back to, to um, Jocelyn, Dan, and Alex in a moment, but maybe we start with Nishant. How do you, how do you react to that, that problem, Nishant? Yeah, so I'll say the same thing that I say to teams internally and externally when I talk to them. Don't wait for privacy re regulation to hit you because you don't get to dictate when it comes. You don't get to dictate its applicability to your company, right? So my general sense is build something in, in anticipation of that regulation coming in. So at every company I've worked at, I work with the legal team and the engineering organizations across the company to come up with an abstraction, borrow the best from GDPR, from CCPA, from ISO, from FedRAP, et cetera, and come up with an internal version saying, if this were to become the law of the land, how would we demonstrate compliance? And also some customers have even higher expectations than any of these laws could have ever prescribed. So that's something else to consider. One example that I think would really resonate with the folks on the panel and even those in attendance would be Jocelyn brought up the example of deletion, right? It's very, very hard to delete data at scale. I like to visualize for the C-suite sort of this horizontal funnel where the narrow end is on the left-hand side. And as you move from left to right, the funnel gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's because every time an engineer gets a hand on data, he or she will copy it, join it to something else, share it with the third party. And those are decisions that are undoable. Like you can't redo that once you've done it. So, so my general sense is my team builds an algorithm to delete data. And what we do is we open up that API for everybody else across the company. What does that do for us? It gives us the ability to track who's actually, actually getting access to our deletion tool and who's not. So if you don't have access to our tool, you have no way to centrally delete data. You have no way to prove that you delete data. And I essentially like to release something like an honors list saying, these are the teams that have onboarded our tool and therefore are deletion champions. That's one thing we like to do. Essentially create some sort of competition. It's a bit like our own version of Politico where you make the horse race, the actual feature, where people love to be on that board because they want to tell their team, hey, look, we're on the board. We do the right thing for the customers. And it enables us to get more traction. So it doesn't quite seem like the big, big, bad privacy folks telling people to do stuff that they shouldn't otherwise do, right? So that's one example. The other thing I would say is uh, definitely stay in touch with the larger community in terms of what's actually happening. So when Alex mentions about all the movement that's taking place in the house, I like to make sure that my team knows what's going on. So we have people from the legal team tell us what to prepare for. So that routinely informs our roadmaps that then flows from us to the different engineering roadmaps. This is a continuous connection process where no one person controls everything from the top down because that's just not how engineering works these days. It's very decentralized. Somebody with three years under them from Carnegie Mellon probably knows more about the tech stack than I do. As an example, once you open an app for, you know, in this case, the 
service sends you a bunch of messages and a bunch of data leaves your phone, your IP address, your device type, your browser type, maybe some cookie information, all that leaves your device, goes into the company systems. From there, it flows to the microservices. From there, it flows to the different S3 buckets. From there, it flows to Elasticsearch and Hive and Hadoop. From where it flows to different third-party vendors. It is literally impossible to stop this at scale. And I would love to see any law Congress or Brussels can pass that would regulate that down to the T. The company needs to have an understanding at scale, at the tooling level, within the engineering and legal privacy organizations, where there is an understanding how to get this done right. So my recommendation would be centralize the tooling, make sure that legal has a say in how that happens, get it into people's roadmaps, have that continuous conversation. And don't be surprised if there's pushback within the company. A lot of these engineers don't know what what goes on behind the scenes. So educate them continually. Having that conversation is pretty critical. So in my case, that's why I got on the product and privacy engineering side, because I had those people skills that I enabled me to sell my products better within the company, but be ready for rejection because getting to yes will take a bit of time. It's sometimes harder than passing privacy legislation. So those of us who do my job within the company appreciate why it's hard for Congress to do theirs because persuasion is not something that comes naturally to human beings these days. So. <laughs> Uh, to, to add to what Nishant said, um, I am grateful that there are there, there, there are organizations like CDT that are focused on trying to move this needle and help make this consolidated and focus on, on federal privacy legislation. I would say after living in DC for 30 years and working in the government and reviewing different legislation, I just remained somewhat jaded. And this is why I focus, like you do, Nishant, on thinking through how do you deal with emerging technical issues, the COVID and vaccine information and AI and the emerging like availability of free code, no code on the internet for you to build something for your own company and save money, but yet having really no understanding and then dark patterns. And I would say, um, I would say some of this, you can, this is what the FTC has been doing with little um, ability to change what they're doing in, in through legislation is to align to deceptive and unfair trade practices with you know, talking about AI and, and talking about the, the, the discriminatory and bias effects that you need to think through, especially when um, there isn't a lot of regulation out there and unlikely that we're gonna get, uh, get some clear guidance outside of principles and maybe the, F, you know, the EU will end up exporting a AI regulatory regime that's, that everybody adopts like GDPR. But until then, Building out a global framework, building out with key requirements that just make make um, that, that are foundational, and building out the program that way to withstand new and emerging issues. It's really important not to just wait for the legislation to do the nu nuances. At that point, if you have a strong framework that really addresses data governance, where your data is, how you're using the data, how long you retain the data, who has access to the data, how are you using the data, basic for, and how are you securing the data, things that are just basic and have that framework. When there's some new urgency, like what do we do about vaccine data? What do we do about contact tracing? What are we doing about the fact that we need to have all of our websites reviewed to make sure that there is no nudging of some decision. You have a framework in place already. And um, I, I want there to be consistent laws so we don't have to understand the nuances of biometric law at the state level and making sure that we're complying across the country. Um, but at the same time, I, we can't wait. And so I am really focused. And I think the FTC kind of feels the same way. They feel like they have existing frameworks to address things like AI and, and dark patterns. And that's why they're pushing also now instead of waiting. And I and, and so I, I take a lot of guidance on how they're framing it under existing laws. That is our compliance risk framework now is existing laws that are either AGs or um, the or our federal government will align if, if people get too crazy with what they're doing in these areas without a new Compli you know, consumer privacy law. Well, and and uh, uh, that's, so that pivot, that's a great point, both you, Nishant, and, and Jocelyn. So that, that brings us to a pivot back for a moment, um, maybe over to Dan, you, and Alex. There, there, there has been a pretty significant, there, there's, a, there's some poten potential headwinds out there on individuals being able to come in and, and get, um, get their rights fulfilled in court at some point here, Dan, in the next few years based on some standing decisions that I, I do think it's worth us talking about. And 
Obviously, there's also been a few court decisions affecting uh, FTC authority. So maybe I could start with both, you start with you, Dan, and then talk over to you, Alex, as well. Um, Dan, could you talk about last week's transunion decision? Just what is it? What does it mean? And what's your view of that decision? And um, and how does it affect people's ability, maybe in the future, to get uh, you know get their ability to challenge and and uh, and bring a case uh, if they if their privacy rights have been affected? Well, transunion follows on a Supreme Court case from 2016 called Spokio versus Robbins. And there the Supreme Court opened the door to the possibility that um, even when a privacy law passed by Congress has a private right of action enabling plaintiffs to sue for violations, that uh, plaintiffs still might not have standing to bring the suit in federal court, even though their rights were violated. Um, Spokio kind of hemmed and hawed and, and was very kind of mushy, ambiguous, and I, I think just didn't really, you know, it, it said, you know, one thing and then the another thing. Uh, and so it was kind of a, a, a really all over the place decision. TransUnion comes in, and this case involves uh, several violations of the Fair Credit Reporting Act uh, by TransUnion. This is a law that's uh, 50 years old. And um, in particular, uh, the facts are kind of outrageous. The uh, credit reports of the plaintiffs had notations uh, that they were potential terrorists, and these were false. Uh, and the plaintiffs had some difficulty uh, addressing the situation and finding out about the situation and so on. Um, ultimately, the Supreme Court said that uh, only those plaintiffs whose credit reports were disclosed uh, to others could uh, have standing to bring their suit. Uh, the rest of the plaintiffs didn't have standing because it wasn't a concrete injury uh, and that therefore um, they couldn't bring their case, even though you had this cause of action. I think it's a very troubling decision. It's a really troubling trend. Uh, standing doctrine is that modern standing doctrine is actually uh, a creation of the court from the 1970s. The requirement was really designed to existing uh, requirement for standing, which was the violation of a right. Um, and Congress has the power to define whatever rights it wants to define. Um, but this court, um, in the guise of so-called, you know, conservative principles, uh, essentially it, it is, is doing the opposite in a very activist way, um, uh, rewriting Congress's laws uh, and telling Congress, no, you can't define a right the way you want to define it. You can't uh, provide the kind of remedies and enforcement mechanisms in a statute that you want to provide. Uh, because we won't let you, uh, you know, bring it in court. So it's, it's a very uh, aggressive move to aggrandize judicial power. And, and the irony is that standing is actually normally a way of the court to be restrained in its power. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something of judicial restraint. But I, ironically, now it's being used as a way to essentially try to nullify something Congress did. And, and, the, and the thing that makes it even worse is that the uh, private right of action in FICRA was a trade for immunity from state law claims for defamation and invasion of privacy. Um, so I think this is a, um, th this doesn't uh, mean that, hey, you know, you don't have to comply with federal laws. Uh, it it may basically means that, you know, the private right of action in federal laws can be limited in, in certain ways by courts uh, the test for limiting it uh, is actually um, a really uh, uh, mushy test. Uh, it's it's kind of looking at well, kind of what does what's traditional in the common law, uh, and irony. Ironically, you know, you, you can look at the common law and you can see it pointing in every which direction, uh, and so you can find a, a lot of cases that would recognize harm in a very similar situation, but the court doesn't seem to uh, actually look. Uh, at the common law in a very deep way. Uh, it it kind of looks in a very superficial, uh, simplistic way uh, and just says, no, no, it's not. 
without actually doing the analysis that its so-called test calls for. But so Dan, uh, if, I'm, if I may on this one, just to, to bring it to, to us, if I'm, if I'm hearing it right, there's a, there's a chance based on this trend in standing law, and, and you and I have talked about this before, this was a, an underpinning of the Amnesty International case as well, which obviously is a surveillance, you know, uh, right of action case as well. Not a right of action, but the ability to bring a case and whether you have standing uh, a case in the surveillance area. But <clears throat> if, I, if I kind of read that back a little bit, if there were a federal law and or otherwise on privacy and it had uh, a right of action, this kind of underlying standing principle, even if there were a federal law and it had those two, could be a limiting principle we're going to be working with in the future. Do, do I hear that right functionally? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and so basically that's going to make it really hard to make the kind of deal that Congress made in FICRA, because the deal was to trade an immunity from certain types of state law suits for the private right of action under FICRA. Uh, and now you have the ultimate gotcha because now that uh, private right of action is going to be severely limited uh, to only certain types of so-called harms as uh, the Supreme Court conceives of them, which is a very crabbed way. So, you know, if, if I'm, you know, Congress and I want to protect privacy, uh, I, I'm not going to be Charlie Brown in the football. I'm not going to make that deal because that that's not, uh, the courts are going to undermine it. Um, so ultimately that, that, that could be a little bit of a headwind in federal law, although still the private right of action is disfavored. Um, you know, the, the idea of a limited private right of action in certain instances uh, could also be um, now, you know, a, a tougher thing to do. Uh, so that, that, that's the other problem. And, and, and ultimately, um, you know, the standing doctrine doesn't, uh, you know, say anything about what state courts can and can't do. And a lot of state courts really don't have uh, standing doctrine and don't follow the Supreme Court's doctrine. So, you know, under state law, it's not going to change anything. Uh, and I think ultimately the larger uh, implication is until people feel that, you know, they are comfortable with how their personal data is being handed, that they're comfortable with privacy, there are going to be more and more privacy laws. It's an itch that's going to keep being scratched. Uh, and I think that, you know, I think industry is coming around to this realization that, you know, um, you know, trying to kill laws, fight laws, you know, you know, and, and, and I, I, it's not necessarily, it's counterproductive because as long as the itch is there, there are going to be more laws. Alistair McTaggart in California had a blank check to put anything he wanted into that referendum, it would have passed. Any referendum, I, I'm willing to bet good money that anything with the privacy in it will pass in California. He could have done whatever he wanted. I think that, you know, just industry should be thankful he didn't do more. Because <laughs> on that, he on that, that, I not, ban the with... internet and, and people would have passed it. So that's the concern. And uh, I just think that the, you know, until there's really a true attempt to come up with meaningful, powerful privacy laws uh, that really address the problem, we're going to see this push for more and more privacy laws. And, you know, policymakers or the Supreme Court uh, thinks that it's doing everybody a favor by coming up with decisions like this. I don't think it's doing a favor. It, it's, it's just making the itch itchier. Uh, and in the long run, um, it, you know, it, it's going to lead to a lot more regulation and uh, problems, I think. For well, yeah, and, and that, so Dan, that, that's a perfect segue over to Alex now to, to react. And if I, if I may, before I turn it over to you, Alex, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I, I want to make sure, Alex, you get your points in. But I'm going to end by asking all four of you whether we're going to have a federal privacy law in the next two years, five years, how about that at the, at the end, what's your view is. But Alex, do you have a reaction to Dan? Uh, yeah, so so again, I, I really much do agree with Dan, particularly on the dynamics of the TransUnion case and the court here really just abrogating rights that, that 
Congress created and that are truly um, raises major problems in terms of separation of powers and the debate going forward. Um, I do think, you know, I think the bigger takeaway is that this just really ups the stakes for conversations around enforcement. Similar to the uh, Section 13 case that you re raised earlier, Justin, which cast doubt and uh, prevented the FTC from using uh, its authority to seek restitution, saying that the FTC can only seek injunctive relief. Those two cases together are creating a dynamic where Congress and the states are gonna be focused on how people actually enforce these protections that we care about. Um, what is the role of the FTC? What are the roles of the state attorneys general? And then how do we write a legislative history that tries to narrow the transunion case in the way that I think one might be able to do on the facts? It's a very specific set of facts that were at issue in transunion. This was information in someone's credit report that was not shared with anyone. Um, and so I think there's work to be done there trying to cabin that set of facts narrowly so that we can indeed continue to protect people when information is shared in any manner that would be harmful for them. I'm gonna take your group question and I'll be the one to kick us off in an answer. It is my job to be an optimist and I'm gonna be an optimist right here. This is the time, this is the moment we are gonna push forward for federal privacy legislation and I hope we see change within the next two years. I love it. Alex taking a stand, two years, here we go. All right, over to you, Jocelyn. So I think Justin, you and I got this question asked like three years ago at an IAPP conference and I, you know, so, I, 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 I'm so happy you feel optimistic. I always love it when I hear Cam Carey talk as well because he's so optimistic. I'm just so jaded. I've read thousands and hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of um, federal data breach laws in my time. I, I, I wish there would, I would say five years. Let me be somewhat optimistic and not say never. So five years. All right, at least we've got to stand. We got two years, five years. Nishant, I'm putting you on the spot. Two, when, when are we gonna have a federal privacy law? I would say closer to five years, but my real hope is it's something that can be quantified where the end result, which is protecting our customers can be measured. I'm more optimistic about the law being passed, a little less optimistic about, about its effectiveness and verification. So I'm really hoping that there is some collaboration between government industry on an ongoing basis to prepare for that moment. Love it. Dan, you have uh, two minutes. What are you gonna say on, on federal privacy law? Two, five, never. I remember this conversation coming up around 2000 about a federal law. Um, uh, here we are, 2021. Um, I remember this conversation with data breach law. I testified before Congress really thought that something was going to happen. Um, you know, at, at this point, it's Charlie Brown and the football. Uh, I'm going to say not two years, not five years, uh, maybe maybe ten years, uh, maybe maybe even more. Um, I I just uh, I, I just don't see it. Too many tough issues. Preemption is incredibly tough. Private right of action is incredibly tough. Um, then we go into other thorny issues like you know what should be a right to deletion, et cetera, and so on. Um, just a lot of really tricky issues that are, are going to be tough. Just on the preemption, what do you preempt? All laws that deal with privacy, uh, how, how do you uh, sculpt that? Uh, and then would uh, the significant number of California legislators be OK with just California just saying, Okay, let's just wipe out a lot of the California law. Well, they're they're a big chunk of the House. You know, why would they uh, tie their hands and and stop their state from you know being able to to regulate this? So I'm I'm skeptical that that you know they're just going to roll over. Um, they'll need something uh, meaningful if they're going to give up that power. And and you know, I I, I just don't see that that kind of a, a compromise uh being made so i'm very skeptical i spend a lot of time talking to congressional staff and one of my messages is legislation is one of the tools in the toolkit and you have other ones that you can use without having to persuade dozens of or hundreds of people to agree with you um so i do think as a takeaway from this even if i'm a little bit on the optimistic schedule with uh two years for federal privacy legislation oversight of this issue is not going away either in the US where we're gonna have an FTC that is trying to come hard at these issues and continue to shape the debate, or obviously in Europe where the battle lines have been drawn and these efforts continue to, to be front and center. So I do think that the message that we began this whole conversation with, Nishant and Jocelyn's talk about how much it is important for people within companies to still take these concerns really seriously and be proactive 
that remains true kind of regardless of the congressional conversation because these issues aren't going away. People are paying attention. Consumers are paying attention and companies really want and need to be on the right side of this and to do so ahead of time before there's a bad story in the newspaper or a regulator coming after them. Agree. Uh, Just a major plus one on that, Justin. If Steve Bannon and Bernie Sanders both agree that tech is bad, we shouldn't wait for privacy regulation to come at us. Let's do the right thing from the get-go. Yeah, no, I, I, Alex, I, I think each of your points are, are spot on. I think the move behind all of this is the human beings, the people who just don't believe they know what the heck's happening with their data. And so it's going to be enforced. There's going to continue to be this move from the people, regardless of whether we can get it through Congress. And um, I, I, I have no doubt the FTC is going to be after some companies in the next few years with the, with the new chair. chair yeah, the, the wor my worst case scenario would be that people would no longer trust us with, with their data. We don't want that. We want our brand to, to be upheld, regardless of the new air issues and new technology, which is why we're leaning so heavily in this notwithstanding any laws notwithstanding the fact that there isn't this law. And so I, I think I agree, Nishant, I think agrees with me really, uh, we all agree on this, that, that, that consumers have a right to have their data protected and we have an obligation to do it, regardless of what it's federal law, global, EU, US. I love that, perfect note to end. Thank you all very much for being here. We've had, we didn't even get to all the questions that came in as I knew we wouldn't. I hope each of you will be back to join us at our next live, hopefully in-person Spokes Privacy Leaders Panel. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stephen, over to you for closing the panel. Thanks, Justin. Uh, so that concludes our Privacy Leaders Panel. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Nishan. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And of course, thanks uh, to Justin for leading and moderating the conversation. <laughs>